right now on Close Up with the Hollywood Reporter. He was like, grabbed my head and he's like, why does your head smell like goat ass? <laughs> <laughs> I got told I wasn't hot enough and they said like, would you come back and like sex it up a little bit? Ugh. Ugh. Yeah, but I did it and I still didn't get charged. <laughs> <laughs> we'll hear from the year's most buzzed about drama actresses in television. Viola Davis, How to Get Away with Murder. Ruth Wilson, The Affair. Taraji P. Henson, Empire. Lizzie Kaplan, Masters of Sex. Jessica Lange, American Horror Story Freak Show. Maggie Gyllenhaal, The Honorable Woman. Welcome to Close Up with The Hollywood Reporter. I'm Stacey Wilson, awards editor at The Hollywood Reporter and your host. Listen in as we sit down with the actresses who delivered the year's most compelling dramatic performances. The roles for which you're here today, your current roles or recent roles, um, what was most surprising to you about playing those roles and, and what scared you the most? I mean, so much. I just remember in knowing forever that the roles for women in television were better, specifically in comedy. Masters of Sex is clearly your most dramatic undertaking. In your yes. Career. What, what frightened you the most about making that transition? Because you had done mostly comedic roles. I mean, the, the transition itself was really scary for me. It, luckily, it served the character really well to feel like a fish out of water, to be intimidated by the man I was working with and to feel like he was just more established in the world I was entering into. It ended up really helping me. Even though, yes, it's a very dramatic role, I see myself as somebody who can do both now, which I did not see myself as somebody who could do both before. But I, I believe that the best dramas have moments of comedy and levity, and mm -hmm. the best comedies Absolutely. have moments of Absolutely. you know real depth and em emotional depth. Mm -hmm. And that's what audiences are coming to expect, which is really nice. And so as an actor, you can find a role that has both of those things. And people don't really settle for something that's just a, a straightforward comedy anymore. It's not good enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about yeah. the rest of you, Taraji? You're uh, the, the most I hate flashy. That bitch cookie. She has stolen my identity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting called cookie everywhere. People don't, my friends don't want to talk to me unless it's about cookie. Like, <laughs> What's the curse of nailing a, uh, nailing a part yeah. like you have? Well, thank you. <laughs> Cookie scared the hell out of me. Why? I, I got that script. I was doing a play. Mm -hmm. I said, fuck it all. I'm going back to theater. I just wasn't fulfilled anymore in what I was doing. And I, I felt lazy. And I felt like I needed to sharpen the tools again. Mm -hmm. And so my manager was like, oh, God, you got to read this script. And I said, didn't I tell you I don't want to do any more television? Why are you talking to me? Goodbye. <laughs> I got to go over my lines. <laughs> and so finally I get home and I read the script. And I'm like, oh, hip hop. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm reading it and I'm like, oh my God, what are they trying to do? Yeah. Fox is going to pick this up? This is not HBO. <laughs> and then I got nervous and I got up and I started pacing the floor. And my dog <laughs> is pacing me because now my brain is like, okay, who people are, we're going to get pissed off. Oh my God, Cookie is so bigger than life. She could either, it could go either way. You can either love her or hate her. She beats us with a bro. <laughs> I mean, I was petrified. Yeah. But then for me, that fear means it's a challenge mm -hmm. that I had to take on. Because if it doesn't shake me up, then why am I doing it? I'm not servicing the character or the fans if I just walk through it. You know what I mean? And that's not what I got in this industry to do. Art is so powerful. And I felt like the subject matter that this project dealt with, something that we'd never seen on primetime network television. And if we, if we do it well, if we handle it well, then it's gonna force people to have conversations that they are afraid to have. And that's what art is supposed to do, in my opinion. So I thought, wow, finally for a chance, you know, we get to like shake it up a bit. Mm -hmm. I just <clears> didn't <throat> know it was gonna shake up this much. How much? <laughs> so let me get this straight. Last Wednesday, you come to my house and give me a rose after you proposed to that bitch. Watch yourself, Cookie. What Watch rose yourself, is she talking Lucius? about? The rose was a, a friendly reminder of where we were yesterday. That's all it was. Mm. Friendly. Oh. <sighs> you think I came here dressed like this for a friendly get together? How much of you uh, did you bring to Cookie? Like with the final, the final product. How much was on the page versus what we ended up seeing? Um, a lot of the one-liners, I, I create a lot of the one-liners. <laughs> but a lot of people think that that's coming from a woman that I know in my life. Actually, Cookie is my dad. 
He was very straight, no chaser. He said it like it was, and nine times out of ten, he was right. You either <laughs> loved him or you hated him because he was speaking truth, straight truth right mm -hmm. at you. What are some of his lines uh, that the you The goat-ass thing about the hair, that was his. <laughs> um, you know I was never in the way in all them damn weaves, girls walking around. They scalp smelling like goat ass. I didn't wash my hair for two weeks one time because it just kept the curl better when it was dirty. And we were on a public bus, and he was like, grabbed my head, and he's like, why does your head smell like goat ass? <laughs> In front of the, everybody on the bus. <laughs> well, I learned the lesson. I washed my hair every two days now, so thanks, but, Dad. But, but, but had, you, had you washed your hair, we wouldn't have that gem of, That's a, true. of a line. See, so everything it happens in life for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> to you. Well, <laughs> How about the rest of you, the, the current, current or most, most recent roles for which your hair, what scared you? I, I know, Maggie, we spoke last year about Honorable Woman and what a challenging endeavor this was for you. I was really attracted to it, like had a kind of magnetic pull toward it, but I didn't understand a lot of it. Um, it's very dense material. I mean, it's difficult. I don't mean yeah. that. I mean, of course, yeah, there was yeah. a lot that I didn't even, I still don't totally understand about <laughs> what was happening in it. But, um, it's complicated. But, but I mean more like about actually who this woman was. I think I kind of disassociated that it was TV. I got all eight episodes at once, so I didn't have... I'm actually really curious about how it feels to get one episode mm. and say, like, I'm going to do this yeah. thing for maybe many years yeah. and... Not um, know what's coming. Not, not, not know who's directing yeah, and know. not really even know who you're getting involved with. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. but so the process of getting involved in The Honorable Woman was just like a movie. It was like I read the whole story. That's it was amazing. one director. Mm -hmm. It was one writer. The same man wrote it and directed it. So I read it and I just was like, oh, I've never done TV, but don't think about that. And about three days in, I was like, this is eight hours long. This is a scope I've never touched before. And I had like a little panic in my trailer where I just kind of <laughs> went like, everybody is relying on me. And not only everybody on set, but also my two little girls exactly. mm -hmm. and my husband. Mm -hmm. And I just was like, how the fuck am I going to do this? And I and I like had all my makeup on and I had a big scene to go and do. And I called my mom, which is weird. I don't know why I did. And I kind of like fixed my makeup and I went, okay, all I can do is just one thing at a time. And I can't do it brilliantly. I can just do it. And I put all the feelings I was having into the scene I did. And the scene's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, it's actually not great. It's all right. You know, and, and I had to sort of be okay with that and move on to the next yeah. scene. <laughs> We're strong, you and I. <laughs> what if they find they out? Won't. <laughs> they might. They will never find out. I promise. Never. Never. I don't know. It posed all sorts of challenges all the way along, but I also have never learned more from anything. You know, not just about acting and stuff, about myself and about yeah. being a mom, too. Exactly. And like how to manage all of it with little kids and come home at night and... Yeah, put absolutely. them to sleep. And... But I also think that, I mean, having come from film to television, these four seasons that I've done and the way we've worked, which is the opposite of having eight scripts, mm -hmm. yes. you barely get the, the first, first one. <laughs> and then you think, oh, and oh, it's different every season. Okay. It, and it's different every season, mm -hmm. so it's not even a character you've established yep. ever before. <laughs> but I love that kind of tornado. I love yeah. that chaos of not knowing where it's going mm -hmm. because it forces you, I think, as an actor to really live within the imagination rather than the idea of like, mm. okay, this is, you know, you get a script, you've got the first act, second act, third act, and you can see what the character is going to do and, and you start to imagine how you're going to do it and get there and all of that. This way of working to me has been so wild mm, and yeah. so unstructured and so chaotic that I've found that the work itself has become more interesting yeah. within that insanity. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourselves for the most death-defying scene. It takes but a split second for this knife to travel from my fingertips to the edge of the wheel split second that separates life from death. I never think about the scene the night before anymore. Mm -hmm. I never like figure out where it's going to go. Learn the lines sitting in the makeup trailer yep. <laughs> and then hit the, you know, hit the stage mm -hmm. and it's amazing what comes. 
And it is free, so much more interesting to me to work that way. Mm. Than, yeah. Yeah. That TV affords you that. Yeah. Well, yeah, especially this kind of TV yes. where you don't know really, I mean, from one moment to another where your character is going. Mm. Or suddenly, you know, you're, yeah, the the backstory is introduced and you discover that, you know, you've had your legs amputated. <laughs> <laughs> so you are a man. You're yes. just, yes. in a snuff <laughs> film <laughs> back in yeah. like, the Weimar Republic. You never and know. It's like, oh, it's you never know. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That makes right. it more yeah. interesting. R- Ryan Murphy was always throwing curveballs your direction. Yeah. <laughs> Viola, your first starring role in a primetime series, it's a lot of pressure. If I will be so bold to say, it was one of those things where I had no precedent for this role. I've never seen anyone, 49-year-old, dark-skinned woman who is not a size 2, be a sexualized role in TV, film, ever. anywhere, ever. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, this role came to me. But to say it was fear would be an understatement. It was bigger than fear. And when I actually um, saw myself for the first time in the pilot episode, I was mortified. Why? I'm just going to be honest. I saw the fake eyelashes. I saw the wig. I, I, I was like, are you kidding me? Who's going to believe this? And then my big aha moment was, this is your moment to not typecast yourself, Mm. to actually play a woman Mm. who is sexualized and actually do your work as an actor, your investigative work as an actor to find out who this woman is and woman up and put a real (laughs) woman on TV that's smack Mm -hmm. dab in the midst of this pop fiction. I don't know what terrible things you've done in your life up to this point, but clearly your comments out of balance to get assigned to my class. I'm Professor Annalise Keating, and this is Criminal Law 100, or as I prefer to call it, How to get away with murder. And don't you always think it's so much hotter anyway to see a woman yes. who looks like an actual woman whose like arms aren't perfect and who's ever, you know, but absolutely. Except your arms are perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I was thinking about my arms. I was I, thinking about you, but I knew <laughs> what was going to come at arms. me. Right. The thing with TV is the likability factor. You know, people have to like you. People mm-hmm. have to think that you're pretty. And I said, okay, there's a huge part of that that's going to be gone. I'm going to have to face the fact that people are going to look at me and say, I have no idea why they cast her in a role like this. She doesn't walk like a supermodel in those heels. But no one her said voice, that, though. Well, people do say that with all due respect. They do. But then what I say to that is that the women that I know in my life who are sexualized are anywhere from a size zero to a size 24. Mm -hmm. They don't walk like a supermodel in heels. Mm -hmm. They take their wig off at night and they also take their makeup off. And it's my way to say welcome to womanhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a chance for me to use my craft. When you talk about likability factor, I'm sure Ruth, your character <laughs> on The likeable. Affair is, um, no, she, she's likable, but it, it's risky because, you know, it's kind of chipping away at this thing, this institution that we all hold dear, which is fidelity. Yeah. I don't mind being a bit um, controversial. Um, but in this particular case, I remember reading the script and really, I hadn't read anything like it in terms of the conceit of the piece. And that fascinated me. And it meant as an actor, you could play two sides of the same character. Yeah, it was controversial. This was about an affair. And from my point of view, I really wanted to challenge the stigma of affairs. And they happen so often, so surely something must be. Uh, They can't be all wrong in some ways. So I wanted to challenge and ask, you know, have these two people falling in love that are both married. And I knew that she was going to get a lot of stick for being the woman. And I knew, and we knew Sarah Treem as well, the writer, was very aware that my character would get a lot more, could get a lot more antagonism from press and from people watching it because it's a woman and you're always seen as... And he's the married yes. man with the kids. Well, she's married as well, but yeah. she, he's got kids and women are often seen as the vixens Scarlet. and the scarlet mm-hmm. lady. So, <laughs> and of course, in his version, that's how I'm sort of perceived. And right. then in my version, 
it's a woman who's you know lost a child. So I think Sarah did help out, major help me out in terms of giving me a dead child. Um, that was sort of no, a, it's true. It made it, it very um, yeah, empathic. It made, yeah, exactly. It made me have, it gave me justification, which I shouldn't necessarily have to have. But I think sometimes those controversial characters are most interesting, and you find humanity within that. So that's your job as an actor is to find, be empathetic to who this character Absolutely. is and why they do these things and find that truth and that love for that character. I, I know what you think you see. Tell me. Well, some easygoing girl who's going to shake you up with her free spirit, so by the end of the summer you can go back home to your boring life with a bounce in your step. Well, I wish you'd at least give me the chance to disappoint you. Yeah, well, I'm not that girl. And I won't rescue you from anything. You're going to be sorry you ever met me. My major concern was the time, yeah, signing up to something which you don't have a clue how it's oh. going to turn out. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. frightening. That's scary. <laughs> and I, you know, even halfway through the show, I was like, I, I can't go even deeper into these depths of despair. I mean, I'm going further and further <laughs> from mental breakdown. And I, I literally was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I've got five weeks left. I phoned my mum. Mom, <laughs> it was like, oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she flew out because she mm. was like, oh, I'm going to be there. Right. And um, But it was that moment of going, I don't know how I'm going to get through these. God, God cut You did bear the brunt of a lot of the, I've got to walk the in sadness. the sea. I've got, oh, I was like, oh, my God. This, how do I even get the journey of this mm. to make it work? And once you're in the work, the anxiety goes away. You're actually just in there digging deeper and mm. finding the journey through. Was there ever a moment leading up to now where you considered quitting acting? Well, early on, when I first started, coming out of drama school was quite tough. And you're going up for every audition and you're going for things that you would never, would want to go for, but you have to. And I think early on, I got rejected so often that I was thinking, I gave myself two years. And if I didn't act in two years, I knew that I wasn't good enough and therefore I wouldn't do it. And were you, but, were you going out mostly for theatrical auditions? Or it was everything. In Britain, you do everything. So it's like okay. theatre, TV, film, whatever you can get your hands on, basically. And um, what was the discouraging feedback you were getting on those auditions? I just think agents throw you at everything to begin with to see what you stick at and what you, you know, where you belong or seem to belong. So it would be that you don't look right or you have the wrong hair colour, things that were pretty discouraging and mm. nothing you had no control over. So it's quite hard realising that early on in your career that you have, in areas, some little control, really. And the access to the roles is what you don't really have control over. Yeah, and there's people that have been in the industry for a lot longer who are well-known, who are going to get those roles over you. So you have to, have, you have to find someone who's going to take a risk on you early on. Mm -hmm. And I think I felt that way before I, I even started mm -hmm. because I didn't know how to get in. The only thing I had was a desire and people thought I had talent. But then what? Right. How do you get a job? How do you audition? You know how to be an accountant. <laughs> you go to right. school, you study, you do all of that. And then I was like, how am I going to make a living? I didn't come from people who could pay my bills. And then, <laughs> and then I majored in English, and I said <laughs> I could become a teacher until I realized I'd make a really bad teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so how did, ultimately, did you overcome those, those obstacles early on? I dove. I think that when your passion and your drive is bigger than your fears is when you just dive. Mm -hmm. And then at any given moment, you're just going to be rejected. It's going to be difficult. I've been on my last unemployment check. <laughs> No way to pay my bills after that. And um, you stay in it because, you know, that's occupational hazard. There have definitely been times where I've realized that I don't have any sort of real education or skills in any other area. <laughs> so I have to make this work or I'm on the street. <laughs> How about the rest of you? Mine started at, in high school. That's the only time I ever can remember quitting. Um, I auditioned for Duke Ellington School of the Arts in Washington, D.C., and I didn't get accepted. And at that young age, you just think 
that their word is law. That mm -hmm. means I cannot act. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I went point. off to college to be an electrical engineer. <laughs> wow. I don't know why. I still count all my fingers. <laughs> but um, I failed. And I guess that detour happened in my life. So once I did make up my mind that acting was the thing that I wanted to do, nothing could discourage me. Yeah, so I kind of right. like I had to go through that because once I got to Hollywood, I was like, okay, no, I've heard that word before. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know, exactly. and then once I um, rerouted my life and I enrolled at Howard University and I actually took up theater and I studied the craft, I felt like I was armored enough to come out to Hollywood. And I knew that I would get told no a million times, so that was no surprise. Mm -hmm. So once I got out here, with yeah. that kind of training, I knew I had a talent. I knew that it was just going to take for somebody to open up the door for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I stayed. I never got into the place of, I want to quit because if I ever get there, I need to. I need to just walk away because then I'm not servicing the role. I'm not servicing anybody. I think what you're saying is true that you kind of have to get used to getting told no. Mm -hmm. And you get told no a lot. I mean, even now I get told no a lot. It's not just when I'm starting out. But you, when I was starting out, I used to hear a lot. And I don't know who was actually coming back and telling me this, but like, you're not sexy enough. You're not pretty enough. Heard that one before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, who's definitely. Us that? Yeah, yeah, who is actually crazy messaging people? this to you? That, who's but crazy who's people. giving you back that <laughs> feedback? <laughs> yeah. back, you know? Um, but I remember one time um, being really young and auditioning for this really bad movie that I just wanted because I was a jobbing actress and it was like vampires were in it. Mm -hmm. stuff, and <laughs> yep. I, and yeah. I had worn this dress actually that I thought was really hot. It was like this black sort of like linen dress where you could see through it a little bit. And I <laughs> went and did this audition <laughs> for this <laughs> movie and I get, got told I wasn't hot enough. And they said like, well, this this manager I had at the time said, would you come back and like sex it up a little bit? Ugh. Oh, yeah, but no. I did it. And I put on, like, leather pants and, uh, um, like, Heels. pink, mm -hmm. kind of leopard-skinny camisole. And I did the audition again, and I still didn't get the part. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and after that, I was like, okay, oh, I'm so <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought the first dress was way hotter. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's the same like you're saying. Then yeah. somebody goes... I'm going to take a risk on this yeah, girl. Exactly. Yeah, I'm yeah, into that's her. That's how it works. Yeah. You know? And like, yeah. someone has effect. to do yeah. that for you. Yeah. I mean, maybe there are exceptions. Maybe if you, well, you can say if you're just extraordinarily beautiful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. What was your experience, Jessica, early on? I don't know. I've been in the process of retiring for the last 30 years. <laughs> you're, you're really doing poorly at it, by the way. I know, I know. But it, it's getting, it, it's becoming more and more imminent. I mean, I realized next year I will have been doing this for 40 years, wow. which seems like many lifetimes. Mm -hmm. I do. I think about, like, having it finish at some point, you know, really saying, okay, I've done this for 40 years. It's been great, um, but now I'm done, you know, and maybe moving on to something entirely different. <laughs> My kids always say, you've been retiring since we've known you. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I mean, but, you know, I think maybe there is a finite time. There is an end date, you know, so I think about it a lot, actually. But the, the thing about acting is, you know, it's so seductive. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. you get drawn into something and it's like, oh, yeah, this is, you know, it's like a love affair. It's like something, there's something really alive about it and you feel great and it's mm. you know it's physical and it's all these things and then you remember why you were doing it to begin with and that it can still seduce you mm -hmm. after 40 years <laughs> which is yeah what would you do like what do you fantasize about doing if you actually did well it's like you know you were saying I mean I've only done two things in my life I've I've been a waitress and I've been an actress yep and um Waitressing was not anywhere near as interesting, <laughs> no. to say the least. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I would do something so far afield. I even thought about what if I went and studied to be a falconer? You know? Amazing. Wow. What a, that's the greatest <laughs> answer ever. Yeah, I, I actually read a script about a falconer. <laughs> really? Yeah. 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 Then I don't have to be one. I can just pretend. Which is what, I mean, at a certain point, you do think, I've been pretending 
yeah. for decades now. Yeah. And that's what I love most about it is that you you are you're still childlike in that way of like mm-hmm. make believe. You know, so maybe that's the answer. Maybe I don't have to become a falconer. It sounded like a lot of work. (laughs) (laughs) And a little dangerous, too, I think. You could actually play a falconer, and then that might get it out of your system. (laughs) But also the thing you're saying about pretending, I I listened to this podcast, maybe you guys heard it, that Ellen Burstyn gave Mm -hmm. recently. Did you hear that? She says something in it where she says, like, a lot of people think acting is, is pretending or, like, you're lying or something like that but that actually even though on some level it it is obviously like you're saying you're not actually a falconer (laughs) but it's it's actually telling the truth yeah and um be your truth but it's that character's truth it's somebody's truth no but for me it's it's usually my truth yeah Yeah. i I find it very therapeutic Mm -hmm. i've healed myself through characters and you know dark places you have to reach to go to find the the emotional place for that uh, that particular character you're portraying and then and you come out the other side of it and it's like you try to reach for the tears and it's like I don't feel that way about it anymore Mm -hmm. I'm healed Mm -hmm. I'm healed (laughs) (laughs) is there a specific point in your career where you look back and felt wow I was really brave to do that playing a pregnant whore (laughs) (laughs) let's talk about that (laughs) that no one wanted to touch in Hollywood this is hustle and flow yeah it was another character that scared the life out of me but Whenever a character scares me like that, then that means, Taraji, it's your job to make the people empathize with her. It's your job to find the why or the how she became this girl. I just want to show people that she's a diamond in the rough. Like any girl that fell by the wayside in life, you know, that didn't have a mother or father, someone to say, you could be anything you want to be. This is what happens to her. But watch what happens when one person says, oh my God, you were good. You know, how many little girls are out here like that? Doesn't mean they have to be on the whole stroll, but that psyche, that, that being trapped and jailed in your mind because you never had anyone to say you can or you're pretty or you're, you can be anything, you know? So that's, that's what I focused on. I was like, I just want people to reach through the screen and want to grab her and hug her or go find a hoe on the corner and save her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> hug a hoe day. <laughs> you know, I have to say, um, save Maggie, I think I read an interview with you. You said with uh, the honorable woman that what you found intriguing about it, that it didn't follow the usual journey that you see in a lot of of women. In the beginning, the problem is introduced and then she cries in the end. She has a revelation and then it's right. gone. And I think that's one of the reasons why I like Annalise Keating is because I, I'm like, why does she have to have a structure? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With me, I feel pretty put together. But I think that some people are like just a tornado inside that they haven't figured out who they are you know usually it's some trauma and um i see kind of annalise like that i think that's why she's scared me in a lot of ways the thing that i that i was kind of getting at when i said that so i did know everything that was going to happen and i didn't like get my legs amputated in a really <laughs> <laughs> like, that would have been really no, astonishing <laughs> and very difficult to play it's good you have a secret you didn't know about <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you so well <laughs> no but um we shot it all all mixed up like so you know it was like doing a big movie like we cross bordered it so yep. it was sometimes episode one, episode eight, episode five or whatever on one day. So in that kind of movie world that we get used to, where you're like, well, obviously I'm only going to cry once in this movie. And yeah, so exactly. I'm just like, uh-huh. keep it together. <laughs> and you can, you know, you give a more like tasteful <laughs> performance, but it looks more like movie land. Like you're talking about, like life looks like this when mm-hmm. someone has a catharsis it happens one time and it, it gets, you get better afterwards. But when you're shooting it all together, like we did, I just, like, couldn't keep track of when I was upset or when I was angry or when I was weak and when I was strong. Or, like, it just got, like, I'm just going to do the scene however I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. And then we'll see how it fits together, which I think does lead to what you're saying. Like, this kind of, like, your brain can't hold it all. Well, it's that element of surprise that they talk about in acting all the time and living in the moment. I use that a lot. I say to myself, um, because I like leaving myself alone now. I love it. Yes. Because what I do is I say, I ask myself a question, why does this scene have to be that way? Mm -hmm. 
Why do I have to say the line like that? Mm -hmm. I'll say it completely different. If I'm supposed to be screaming it, I'll say it calm. And through that is a period of surprise and discovery where I find Mm -hmm. that the scene will take me to a place Mm -hmm. that's far more interesting than I possibly imagined when I was sitting in my living room. Right. Yeah. So that, see, that's the one thing I would say, like, about the, um, like you're talking about. Mm-hmm. I, had the, I had a rape scene in The Honorable Woman where um, it was written really clearly. I had, like, an idea about the scene, which I'm glad I hold on to, mm-hmm. which was, like, you know, she was written to be immediately just saying, like, no, no, oh, no, no, please, no, right away. And oh, I yeah, wanted yeah. her to be, like, complicit, wanting sex, the strangest, darkest, most painful sex up until when it turns into rape. Yeah, exactly. You know, like I wanted mm-hmm. her to want something she knew she shouldn't want, like all the way along. And so I like, I kind of, that was like an idea I had in my living room. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I, that's like yeah. That was an example of one where I was like, how is this scene going to work? I don't want to play it like this, like the way you're saying, like mm-hmm. I had the idea first. And sometimes you have to let go of that idea, obviously. Yeah. But exactly. sometimes you see, I see actresses or actors, I see people who seem like they fought an ordinary idea with their mind. Mm-hmm. And I'm so glad they did because yeah. it tells a story that's way more interesting. But it is interesting because usually when you have it, like you say, when you have a script the whole way through, you construct that stuff in and you think, right, I can feed that in early or, mm-hmm. you know, and so it's, I mean, for me, this was the first experience I had on doing TV in this way as well. So it was the same. I was a bit scared by all that process, and I found it quite hard to begin with. But like some of the scenes are the best I've ever done in terms yeah. of you're free it. and you're spontaneous and you're instinctive, and you just have to play. So it, that for me is it's it was hard to begin with because you have to lose let go of control mm-hmm. and just be with each other and support each other through it and just and you're really kind of living inside the imagination yeah. mm-hmm. I recently learned how to not to leave it alone because I would go yeah. home the night before and say okay this is the scene but I was always smart enough and trained enough to know that I can't practice to say it this way right. no. but it just mm-hmm. made me feel safer um, to mm-hmm. have that sort of structure to at least know when I go to set tomorrow I'll know my lines but but then I found that it was sort of restricting because mm-hmm. then you block yourself if you can't get that word. And it's like, if you just... Exactly. One of the best scenes I did actually took me to the Emmys. I didn't even think this daggone Lifetime movie of the week went to mm-hmm. the Emmys. I had no idea. No one saw that coming. But the scene that they used was a scene that was an incredible weighty scene where I go to get help because my husband, has, my boyfriend or whatever he was, took my son to Korea and without my knowing and just disappeared into another the country. So I'm going to the FBI to try to get some help. And they're just going through all this fucking red tape. And they're not telling me how to get my son. And I, it was a heated moment. And I didn't know the fucking lines. And I panicked. And they kept saying, are you ready? I was like, give me five minutes. Just let me. <laughs> and there was a, the storm was about to happen. And then all of a sudden, a calm came over me and said, girl, you've been doing this too long. You got this. You know where you are. You're a <laughs> mother. What happens when you go to the FBI and want help and they're not helping you? Go in there. <laughs> 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 so I put the paper down and I went in there because you know the the, the crew, they sense us they sense yeah, us yeah, and they go yeah. off mm-hmm. of our energy and they saw me and I'm really a bubbly person yeah. you know and they saw a moment of panic and you could feel the the whole set they tensed up and so when I went in there it, it just came to life and I just started doing things that maybe I wouldn't have seen if I had structured it the night before yeah, yeah, yeah. and we got an Emmy nomination <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it paid mm-hmm. off it paid off I did want to get to something that affects every person at this table or has in your career, which is how to deal with nudity. What is your relationship with having to do these kind of scenes now? And and how has it changed since you were younger? And maybe start with Lizzie because your show is definitely the most... Show my titties all the time. (laughs) (laughs) Show tits. Yeah, show tits. Hey! Um, I think (laughs) that people are like, hey, I love your work. My dad's friends, I love the show. My dad's friends, I love the show. (laughs) Oh, no. That's the worst. (laughs) Yeah, it really is. I think the the moment that I was the most afraid of nudity was before I did it for the very first time, which was on another show on True Blood. And after doing it for the first time, it just got so much easier. It still isn't 
my favorite thing to do at work. It's never 100% comfortable, but I do think I'm at a point where it's as close as it's going to get. There was one moment, I actually just, well, I haven't watched any of the second season of my show until last night. There's a moment where I, he like kind of takes my robe off and I'm naked and then I transition into a locked eye, full on masturbation scene, like from beginning to end, wow. completely Whoa. naked. And that moment- <laughs> And where's the wow, camera? Wow. The camera- it, well, Was it on it him was at one all? Of our, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, no, yeah. and uh, mostly my face, honestly. I, we have a female showrunner and mm -hmm. she considers herself a, a bit of a prude. She and is, yeah. Yeah, she is. Yeah. And we don't, I don't believe we have gratuitous sex scenes, even though there's so many sex scenes. I really believe, our show's about sex. It, it moves the story forward, and we all really hold her to that, and it's not that difficult to do because she doesn't really want to shoot those kinds of scenes anyway. We could have an affair. Millions of people do, but an affair, it's a fairly pedestrian thing, and the story always ends the same. Does it? What we have between us is so much more than that, it, more than a simple affair. We have the work. But I remember in being in my trailer and really for the first time since starting the show thinking like, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go out there and have to do this. I'm very uncomfortable. Nobody was making me uncomfortable. It's just shitty to have to stand there completely it's naked. Very vulnerable. It's completely yeah. really vulnerable. vulnerable. Yeah. It and so be the reason, exactly, and it should be uncomfortable. And the nature of that scene, it, talking about what we, what we were saying before, like how you played that, the rape scene. It, it's the masturbation in front of a man mm -hmm. is so easily like this sort of theatrical, like mm -hmm. moaning, like oh god. But that's so <laughs> for him, and that right. that moment. It was the total opposite. It was supposed to be for her. Mm -hmm. He wants her to beg She's him for sex. Him in that scene. Yeah, and yeah. in that moment, it's so quiet, and you know she gets off, but it's for her. Mm -hmm. Whilst it's a power play, it's not like oh look at me masturbating for your enjoyment. That said, uh, it was rough. The only the only good <laughs> part about it is they're really cool when I say okay let's do this in two takes because I'm, I don't want to yeah. do this all day long and they're great mm -hmm. about it and then two weeks later uh, Michael Sheen had to do the exact same thing yeah. <laughs> so yes yeah, so you do have equal opportunity on your show yeah the, How the, about the naked rest of you? standing masturbation thing which been your everybody. experience I've only done one sex scene before and um, and it didn't show anything so this was there was a demand obviously again it's about it's called the affair there's a sexual content in it and I was always quite insistent, and Dominic and I were really insistent that scenes had a narrative. You can't, I mean, to do just a normal generic sex scene, they've been done so often badly as well as good. So I always feel like if you're going to do it, it has to say something. And you have to, there has to be a journey going on in, the, in both people. And we worked really hard with the showrunners to say, is this necessary? Are we, what are we saying here? I think there's an assumption sometimes that women are the point of titillation literally yeah. and I think that that's still an assumption that's made and I wanted to get my contract like equal orgasms you know like every <laughs> female orgasm has to be a male orgasm because you actually requested that I didn't but I'm thinking about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. only, only because I sort of feel like they should be there's always yeah. the camera always lands often often lands on the female and ask the female to provide that right. um whereas I think it's it's equal right sex mm -hmm. is a, a kind of it's happening between two people so I don't know, there's still, I think there's still more to be done in it, and I think that th there is still a, a, an assumption. But, pe but in these shows, and what we all have been playing in these shows, is really interesting women, conflicted women, and complex women. And, that, and part of your relationship and who you are is sexual as well as anything else. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to bring that into those scenes, and that's starting to happen, which is really exciting. The How about the rest of you? My first time ever being nude was my very first movie ever. Talk about intimidating wow. and scared uh. and this, it was Baby Boy and I knew the scene was coming. I know, I read the script, I knew what I signed up for. And I said, you know what, Taraji cannot be in that room. I gotta somehow deal with me before I have to take off my clothes because then if I go in there feeling some kind of way about my body, yeah. it's not about Yvette, it's about Taraji and her insecurities. So I literally went home and I stripped down naked. I just stripped down naked and I stood in front of the mirror and I just looked at every morsel of my body and I dealt with it. I dealt with it. I just said, well, you know you don't like that. Okay, get over it. That way, the next day, I was so free. I was so ready. I get to set, Tyrese is going to hate me. He's over in the corner because he hadn't dealt with it. 
I don't want to be naked in front of everybody. Why do we have to do this thing, John? <laughs> so I see what's going on. And like the women, we always take control of the situation and calm <laughs> everybody's nerves. So I go over to John and I say, John, you know what? This scene has to really be intimate in order for it to live. We have to feel like we're in that room alone. Is there some way? Clear the set, first of all. How do I know? I've never done a movie before. I don't know. Clear the set. Something just took over. Make these people go away and some kind of way put up a fake wall with just the lens sticking out so we can feel mm -hmm. comfortable. And so we did. They started doing that. And Tyrese slowly started coming out from his little corner. <laughs> and he takes his robe off. And then the next thing, the scene was beautiful. It was like these two young people in the bedroom, mm -hmm. and it was great. I think sex in film is so interesting. I mean, of course it's uncomfortable to take your clothes off in front of people you don't know, and it feels weird, And but I think it can be such an opportunity for really interesting acting. So I'm 37, and I've had two babies, and I don't know, I'm kind of like interested in nudity now, and like what More it, so than when you were younger? I was interested in them too. <laughs> but I mean, but never, look, I was never the actress who was asked to be the like hot girl who just took her clothes off on her first day of work. I was, I wasn't, I never had that. I, I always, whenever I was doing nudity, there was always some, um, something else that the scene mm -hmm. was about. I wasn't totally objectified that way, but I am interested in like, you know, like, in The Honorable Woman, Nessa is such a controlled person for some big chunk of it, and I, I really wanted the sex to be, like, animal. <laughs> or, or, you know, like, what a, a woman who's my age actually really looks like, and how is that hot? And, and I actually, I am much more turned on when I see shows where people's bodies look like bodies mm -hmm. I recognize. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So there is a responsibility to yep. show that mm -hmm. kind of, I mean, on, on my show, there's women of all ages, all mm -hmm. body types. Right. It's very equal opportunity. And I think it's an important thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, not for any gratuitous sex scenes, but like saying something with a sex scene other than like, look at my boobs and look, it looks like we're having sex. It's very and like, courageous because even when you look on stage at sex scenes, it's like, you've been to the gym right. <laughs> yeah, right, right. four and, times yeah, no, today. And, and it's, it's every morning a sex scene. No yeah, right. yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't hard. mean to act like I'm not doing that either. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the truth. It's like, you're like, okay, so I'm going to have a smoothie for breakfast. Yes. And I'm gonna, like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's the truth. But you, you look how you look. I've had to do a couple of sex scenes in How to Get Away with Murder. One where I was thrown up against the wall, and I'm like, I don't want to get thrown up against the wall anymore. I threw my back out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> I just allow myself to be uncomfortable. Yeah, mm -hmm. smart. I'm not going to talk myself out of it. I'm not mm -hmm. going to stand in front of a mirror and look. If I stand in front of the mirror and I'm looking at my body, then Viola will kick in and go, okay, um, my titties or saggy uh, <laughs> stretch marks or, you know, I don't know. I mean, I am just a human being yeah. at the end of the day, yeah. mm -hmm. okay, and I'm doing something very private in public. And the nerves and the insecurities and all of that, I feel, is a part of Annalise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I cannot yes. will her to yes. be made of Teflon right. mm -hmm. before yeah. she dives on top of a very hot looking guy. Yeah. 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 But all of that is in the scene when you're having sex. Yeah. You're, you're, you're anxious, you're yeah. hot, yeah. you're Absolutely. nervous, That's what I'm saying. You're yeah. all of that. You let it live. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about typecasting. Um, tell me how it's affected you in your career. Typecasting has directly affected our work as actors because what is a type? What does sexy look like? Mm -hmm. What does sexy yeah. feel like? Mm -hmm. How is it played out? Mm -hmm. Who is the geek? Who is the nerd? Mm -hmm. You know, and therefore what happens is when you get these roles, you automatically fall into it of what you kind of seen on TV and film. But you never really go to the truth of what it actually means right. to be sexy. I have found that at this point in my life, that I no longer want to do that. I reject that notion. It's like what Uta Hagen said. She's like, mm. in my life, I saw myself as kind of sexy, funny, <laughs> eccentric. And then I would look at myself on screen and see this like saggy middle-aged woman. <laughs> and I, I want to say to Uta Hagen now, you are that woman. Mm -hmm. You are that woman. If you get that narrative, you absolutely are that woman. But do you ever find that like, okay, you do a part and if you get attention for that part, then lots of people offer you things like that? Yep. Yes. 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 
then, but yep. then the person who doesn't offer you that, somebody who like sees through that and says yeah. like, do mm-hmm. you want to play this part? Yes. In my experience, that is the part I need to play now. Yeah. Yep, you know exactly. what I mean? Yeah. I did that with, I had China and all these very sort of costumed, mm-hmm. sort British. of quiet, <laughs> um, innocent women. And then suddenly I was offered Luther, which was this psychotic, <laughs> sexy, femme fatale character. And it was amazing. It was exactly the right timing for me mm-hmm. and where I was in my personal life or whatever yeah. and felt that I was more confident to play mm-hmm. that sort of role. Don't you think in some strange kind of, not to sound too psychedelic or anything, <laughs> that like parts come to you at a certain moment yeah. yes. in your life. It's almost like a learning experience. Mm-hmm. It's like the universe has presented you with, okay, now you will, you know, your father just died. You are going to now have this period of time where you are going to work on. Yeah. Or yeah, absolutely. you are, you know, you're in a crisis here in yeah. your relationship. So here's a way to kind of move through something, to maybe learn something, mm-hmm. to experience it. And I always think that's the best work that you do. Yeah, mm-hmm. I agree. But who is the person, this is what I mean, who like identifies in some way, oh, that woman should do this part now, like comes to you for that part that's not like anything you've ever done but is exactly the right part for you. Well, I think they're <laughs> seeking that out too. Mm-hmm. You know, especially the ind- like more independent filmmakers who get to make that decision. They want the credit for seeing you differently, which is great because it provides opportunities for us. And if we didn't have people doing that, that would be terrifying because you would just be playing the same role over and over and over again. But it's about your interest as well, isn't it? I think it's things come your way and at a certain time you wouldn't even look twice at that role. Mm. But when you're in a certain time in your life, Mm. suddenly it feels really appealing. Whereas five years earlier, you might not have done that. So I think it's a combination of the two. Or might not have been ready. Or might not have been ready, yeah. Yeah. True. And that brings me to uh, entitlement. Now I see the new actor emerging who only picks the role they feel like they deserve. So they're not out there, like in the fields, discovering, you know what, I did this role, I did it this way, didn't work. So then they'll mm-hmm. go to a regional theater gig mm-hmm. or a Broadway mm-hmm. gig or off-Broadway or bad after-school special on TV. Mm-hmm. And after years of experience, they develop a way of working. Now they want to be Denzel Washington. Right away. They want to be right. Jessica right. Lange. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. But, right know, away. but doesn't it happen so anyway? The they could try. They could, one, could go out and be like, I'm only going to, I'm going to do what you're saying, you know, and only take mm-hmm. the best roles or whatever. But everybody fails. Like, How everybody, do you, right? Who is that person that's able to do that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is no one person. Character. No, but, but do you know what I'm saying? It breeds a different kind of actor than the one that got the big part fresh out of the gate. And there are those stories. People love those stories. Oh, she yes. came straight from acting school. And look, now she's like the star Lupita. of this movie. Lupita. Mm-hmm. Lupita's yeah. a perfect yeah. example. And yeah. mm-hmm. I think everybody, I, I certainly had that. That's going to happen to me, obviously. And it so didn't happen to me. And for a while, that was a that was tough to swallow. But I'm so grateful that I had yeah. to do yes, it that way, that absolutely. I had to scrape my way up. I always think that film is still seen as a pinnacle of mm. the acting profession. Mm-hmm. It's always what you seen and it's what most people get money for or it's well superstar. Superstar, superstar. Yeah, you Yeah. I mean for me I came from theatre, so theatre isn't somewhere to go back to, it's what I need every yes, every two years. I need to go and do a bit of theatre to make me feel my soul replenished <laughs> a bit. So it doesn't feel like it's a step back or it's I've failed in the film world or any other world. It feels like that actually That's really helps me. But that was God, the English. The, I mean, the way things were done there were so much yeah. more intelligent than the yeah. way things were done yeah. here. I mean, I remember when I was I did two product, three productions in London, and those actors would come to work in the theater in the evening. They would have done some kind of radio uh, drama right. in the <laughs> yes. daytime. They were yeah. also doing television. They were doing films. Yeah. I mean, it was just effortless the way you could. They weren't put in a box from one. One to another. I mean, I think in some way it's getting somewhat better here because yeah. television has become the equal to film and yes. as far as creativity mm-hmm. and, and uh, in some ways even surpassed it. But I remember the first time, like, I did uh, theater in New York. I was just beat up like crazy mm-hmm. because I was a, a film actor. Yeah. How dare I come to oh, right, a yeah. serious play well. on <laughs> 
stage on Broadway <laughs> as though it was like some kind of fucking holy grail. Yeah, I know, I know. You know? And now Broadway's clamoring to have huge stars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I went from an Oscar Academy Award nomination to number 10 on the call sheet. Like, I don't think about stuff like mm-hmm, that. I don't mm-hmm. think just because I've made it to this elite, you know, group yeah. of actors in the business, that means that I'm never going to do theater again, or that means I'm never going to take an independent again. No, I love the craft of acting. If yeah. I fall in love with the role, I don't care if it's outside in the parking lot. Like, that's what I love to do. Every actor has a dream role. I'd love to know what yours is. How about revisiting something? Sure. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, yes. yes. Oh, even better. Better yeah. question. <laughs> um, I'm going to do a production uh, next year. I, I get, I, and I really feel like, you know, when these things come back around, they come back around for a reason. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it is like a blessing. So um, I'm going to play Mary Tyrone again from Long Day's Journey and Tonight. Oh, so, I mean, wow. it's like... Yes. When was the last time you played the part? Um, is it 10 years ago? No, 15 years ago. 15 years ago, I did a production in London. When you play a part, especially if you do it on stage and you play something that's written like O'Neill writes or William writes, so you've got like this amazing character, this amazing role, to play it and then to step back and to leave it for Mm -hmm. a decade or Mm. less, four years, five years, whatever, and come revisit it, to come back to it. The work becomes like something else. I I don't know how to explain it, but it's like it's already all there, like in your, Mm. you know, your marrow and in all your muscle memory and everything. It's there, but then it it finds a new expression, and that to me is really thrilling. I want to play a superhero. (laughs) I want to be a Bond girl. I want to play a man. I want to play a white woman. I want to play everything I've never played before. Absolutely. <laughs> that is quite a list. I love it. it sounds like an Eddie Murphy move. <laughs> Hamilton. <laughs> Hamilton. I'd like to start working with some really good directors because I haven't done all that many films, let alone like those actually really good <laughs> films. It was a uh, dream director. I mean, I'm a huge, huge Wes Anderson fan, but like the Coen brothers would be... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the first one, or like so David awesome. O. Russell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> guys. They make a movie a year, so you're yeah. 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 They do. I can, yeah, I, I, the script of that uh, Hail Caesar right. for some much smaller role that I don't even think I could have done anyway, but I was afraid to even read it because I knew that I wouldn't want to read any other script. Oh. And every other script <laughs> would just spoil hail and embarrass them for like six months. <laughs> so... That's probably not the way to get a part in one of their movies by not reading the script and not going after it. But, you know, <laughs> maybe so. <laughs> well, now they'll know that you're interested. <laughs> yeah. Yes. How about you, Maggie? I would like to be in a Quentin Tarantino movie. That would be awesome. awesome. Or yeah. a David Lynch movie or mm-hmm. Pedro Almodovar movie. Okay. Yeah. Very and specific. I'll play anything they want. <laughs> How about you? You want to play a black woman, don't you? I want to play a black woman. <laughs> oh, a black man. man. <laughs> you um, and I'm also revisiting a role in theatre, which is another Eugene O'Neill part, but mm. five years after having done it. So that's kind of Anna interesting. Mm-hmm. Same as you. It's yeah. kind of interesting. And going back to those roles, which are so dense, yeah. to go and do again when you haven't got the first form of nerves yeah. approaching a character. Mm. I want to do Head of Gobbler. Oh, I yeah. was just Only because you do I Hedda think Gobbler. that so... There's a lot of people who got it right. Mm-hmm. I also want, want to revisit Isabella in Measure for Measure. Mm-hmm. I think it's a very difficult role. And all the roles that I really want to play, I'm producing Harriet Tubman because oh, ooh, I yes. want to be reintroduced to her, who she mm-hmm. really is. Mm-hmm. I want to feel like my past counts for something. I've been doing it for 27 years. I've been performing in basements of churches, off-Broadway, on-Broadway. I've got two Tony Awards. I want the work to reflect my level of gifts Mm -hmm. and talent. There it is. I don't want it it to reflect my color or my sex or my age. Mm -hmm. That's what I want. 
Well, that's what I want. Mission I want accomplished. That too. Yeah. Mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> so very quickly, what is your guiltiest TV pleasure right now? I don't feel mm. guilty when I watch Derek. <laughs> that's sweet. That's a sweet show. I love his show. And occasionally when I need to forget my life, I like to go and watch Ratchet television. Yes. And that's Housewife of any housewife. <laughs> oh, that's yes. Hip-hop. Thank you. Yours is also Housewife. I am yeah. Real Housewives. Yeah. Very into the Real Housewives. Yeah. It's like yep. eating McDonald's for yep. your brain. <laughs> it's amazing. It makes you forget about all the extra stuff in your life, Brandy right? Needy. Maggie, what's yours? It's meditation. Jessica? Antique Roadshow. I can't get down with that. I love, I, I've tried it. It's very relaxing. It's very relaxing. It's strictly calm down. Dancing or something, okay. which okay. is dancing with the stars in England. Dancing version, with yes. the stars. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, and Viola. I love Snapped. What's that? It's a show where they profile uh, killers who are women. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, oh, they, they're seemingly great. ordinary women. <laughs> they're amazing. school teachers. They have master's degree, and then something happens. But snap. when they snap, snap. I mean, they it's like off. they. Is there a sound effect? Like when they they announcements or something? Oh, yeah. it's pretty yeah. guilty. Oh, oh, like you win. You win. Yeah. That's great. Well, yeah. thank you all for being here. Thank you. Um, it was a, a real pleasure and. Yeah, congratulations on everything. So thank you. Oh, whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> there, there could be some libations somewhere yeah. at some point. You earned it for sure. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.